Uh, first and foremost, I think, is the Blassen game uh, type curve analysis method. Um, this has been around uh, since, uh, uh, you know, probably the mid-1990s and uh, has really become a uh, very well accepted methodology in the industry for analyzing both oil and gas reservoir production data. It's based very much on the Fetkovich methodology and uh, we talked uh, er early about the Fetkovich uh, type curves which of course has been around even for 10 or 15 years more than the, uh, earlier than that. Uh, Blassing game uh, uh, solution represents uh, some additional modifications to Fetkovich. Uh, for example, one of the things that Blassing game type curve method allows is it allows for the changing operating conditions. Um, another thing that it allows for is it includes an analytical solution rather than empirical decline curves. And we'll take a look at what that looks like in just a minute. Um, there's some other things as well, rate integral and rate integral derivative type curves. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, well, if we compare blasting game type curve analysis to Fetkovich, um, in Fetkovich we have a series of different decline stems. In blasting game we only have one decline stem. Um, I'm going to switch my screens here and show a picture of this using uh, the software. Uh, in Fetkovich, we have our uh, transient stems transitioning and then our boundary dominated stems on the right hand side. Uh, these stems represent the different B values from the ARPS decline curves. When we move over to the blasting game method, uh, what we're going to see, and I'm going to turn these two off to start with, is we're going to see all those same transient stems, but only one boundary dominated stem over here. And the reason for that is the, the uh, solution or the analytical uh, uh, work that's being done behind the scenes here is based on the analytical solution that we talked about earlier. It doesn't use the ARPS decline stems. And that, that's an advantage because um, all of my data uh, should, if, it, if things are being done properly, should end up on that one single curve. And I don't have to choose which one of those different ARPS decline stems to match to. Uh, that's a big advantage because as we saw earlier, there's, there's a lot of non-uniqueness in choosing which one of those curves we have. So if we can get them all to kind of line up together onto one, uh, that would be great. And let me explain how that works. Um, we talked before about material balance time. And material balance time takes uh, all of that production data and organizes it into an equivalent constant rate solution. And Blassing Game and his colleagues and students were really the ones that uh, developed that solution and made that uh, a sort of a practical type curve analysis. So this becomes quite powerful because I can take all my production data and it doesn't matter whether it's occurring at constant rate or constant pressure or variable rate, variable pressure where things are changing a lot through time. Uh, the data will always end up looking like an equivalent constant rate solution because we're using the material balance time function. Uh, the other side of this uh, is, is that, of course, to make this work, we have to use the normalized rate. And if you recall, the normalized rate, what did I do with the pen there? The normalized rate was uh, production rate divided by delta P. Okay, so it's normalized, it's flow rate divided by delta P. Delta P was uh, initial pressure minus flowing pressure. So everything in this equation, or this, uh, sorry, uh, variable is known. We know the production rate at every point in time. We know the flowing pressure at every point in time. That's the data that's being plotted on these type curves. And then, of course, the data is being organized through time using the material balance time function. And if you recall, the material balance time function was cumulative production divided by flow rate. Again, everything in this variable is known as well. So at every point in time I know how much gas has been produced or how much oil has been produced and I know what the production rate is. So the blasting game method is very practical. It uses data that we collect as a part of good production practice and we plot it on the curve. Now one thing that is not uh, um, known ahead of time is the average reservoir pressure and of course we have to use the pseudo time if we're, if we're talking about gas 
and pseudo time is an iterative procedure. So one thing that you're going to see when you move the data around on these type curves is there's a little bit of a dynamic effect in the data. Uh, as I'm moving the data back and forth, uh, there's a bit of an expansion and compression effect. The, data's, the data points are moving relative to each other. Uh, that's because of pseudo time. Okay, pseudo time is causing that to happen. And, it, and again, pseudo time is allowing the uh, gas compressibility and viscosity to change as the average reservoir pressure changes. So it's an iter iterative procedure as I move the data around. If I analyzed oil data on this plot, we wouldn't get that effect because we don't typically, we don't use pseudo time for oil. Because the assumption for oil is that we have single phase and in single phase systems, we assume that the fluid properties are constant. And that's a pretty good assumption. We can't make that assumption for gas and so therefore things change quite dramatically. So that's why you're getting this expansion compression effect going on here. So what I'd like to do is, is just talk a little bit about how we do this sort of analysis and, uh, and what kind of results we can get out of it. And I guess most importantly, you know, maybe apply some sort of uncertainty range on some of these numbers that come out. Because uh, using these methods is fairly straightforward and we can always get an answer out of it. But I think what's most important is understanding how much uncertainty there is in that answer. If it's, an, it's, if it's a number that we have very good confidence in, uh, then we can, you know, take something like this to management and say, this is the answer that I think. In other cases, there may be lots of different answers. It may be a, a data quality issue or just simply that we don't have the right data for the right flow regime. So I want to, want to give you a, a little bit of a sense for how that kind of works. Um, in this particular example, if you remember, what is it that we look for in the data when we match it to the type curves? Well, we're looking for this downward concavity. And the downward concavity, if you recall from our discussion of type curves before, uh, illustrates that I have boundary dominated flow. So the turn down or the downward concavity tells me I have boundary dominated flow. Once the data starts to head down this path, uh, this, is, this thing becomes a unit slope. Uh, this is an equivalent to the harmonic type curve or the harmonic decline stem, which you will remember is the constant rate solution once we reach boundary dominated flow. So that tells me I've got boundary dominated flow. The data that is on this side in the early time, of course, is the transient data. I need to do one more thing before I can move forward. I need to select which one of those stems best represents that transient data. And that may not be easy to do. If I don't have any data up here, there will be some non-uniqueness there. In this particular example, I think I've got enough data to, to do a pretty good job of selecting the transient stem that, that fits that data set the best. So that would be my analysis. And if I were to give this uh, as an example data set to all of you to, to try it and see, see what answers you come up with, um, you might come up with something like this, but maybe something a little bit different. So there's, there's never an exact answer with these things. Okay, we always have to understand that production data analysis is subjective. We're all going to have different opinions about it. Um, maybe somebody else would p pick an RED stem of 48 instead of 28, okay, which is the one that I picked. And that's going to change these, these numbers a little bit. But it's not going to change them that much. And we're, and, and we're going to get something that's close. So the hope is that, you know, we're never going to get an exact answer, but the hope is that we're going to get something that at least is in a, a reasonable range. Okay? Now, since this is boundary dominated flow, I'm going to expect that my original gas in place number is going to be a pretty solid number. And that's what you'll see in these sorts of situations. As I move this data around, there's really only one place on that set of curves that's going to be able to match that data set. And I, and I can't, I mean, I could try and move it over here or up here. There's really only one place that it fits on there. And that's what's going to give me that gas in place number. If I change, so you'll, if you can read that number, it's, it's roughly 2.3 BCF. If I change the RED stem, I'm going to change it to some completely different number. You will notice that that original gas in place number did not change. So it really doesn't care which one of the RED stems I use. RED, if you remember, is the dimensionless reservoir radius. Uh, really, that type curve stem is going to change the skin and the permeability 
it's not going to affect the original gas in place because all of these stems blend together into one single unit slope at the end and that's where my gas in place comes from. So that gives you a sense with this data set that we have a lot of confidence in the original gas in place number. We see boundary dominated flow, we have a fairly unique solution. By contrast, let's take a look at the other example. And in this example, uh, we have some data, uh, just as much production data in terms of time, but it comes from a much lower permeability system. Now, I'm, I'm very quickly just going to do a, a filter on this data so we can see the main trend. And I'll talk about filtering a little bit later on. But what I, what I want to show here is the shape of this production data on the curves. And in this particular case, in terms of the number of months of data, it's the same amount, but this obviously comes from a lower permeability system or, or a much larger reservoir. We have not seen the boundaries of this reservoir yet because the data has yet to turn over that corner. So in terms of trying to understand what the gas in place is, I can do my type curve match here and it gives me a gas in place number, the same as it did with the other example, but I don't have as much confidence in this answer, and I'll tell you why. If I move this over a little bit and say, well, I'm gonna be a little bit different here and analyze it this way. Well, now I've, my original gas in place number has changed dramatically, but I still have what looks like a good solution with the data matched to the type curves. So the non-uniqueness in terms of volume in place or gas in place becomes very apparent with this data set Whereas with the other one, it, it was really locked into that answer. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, we're really looking for that downward concavity and that kind of gives us our anchor, which tells us that our original in-place volume is, is secure or is, is a fairly reliable number. In this case, we haven't reached it yet. So what do we do? Well, there is no way for me to know what the ultimate recoverable reserves or the original gas in place is for this example because I have not seen the boundaries yet. So I have to work with, you know, a minimum gas in place. And I would obtain the minimum gas in place by moving this as far to the right as I can and matching it on the curve that represents that solution. The interpretation here is that tomorrow this is going to reach the boundary, boundary dominated flow and it's immediately going to go into boundary dominated flow. Therefore, the original gas in place is the minimum original gas in place. So that's typically how we analyze transient data sets. In terms of the permeability in skin, they're going to be pretty good quality numbers in this case. Um, it, it looks like I've got 0 0.08 or 0 0.09 for permeability and a skin of about minus four. Even though I moved this over back, back to the other place it was, I, I had it before, and redo the match, now I've got 0 0.08 and minus 4.5. Even though I changed the type curve and moved the data, the, the, the answers didn't really change that much. And that's a property of those blasting game type curves. They will tend to give different, or they will tend to give similar transient results even if you match the transient data in different places on different stems. Because really they're the same solution, they're just offset. Okay, so our transient solution is pretty clear and pretty reliable. Our boundary dominated solution is not in this case. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the other example. And the next thing I want to illustrate are the um, auxiliary type curves and data sets that we have and talk a little bit about those. So I'm going to redo this match. And I'm going to bring these on. Okay. And you'll notice that I can move these three together. There's now three data sets and I'm matching them on three sets of type curves. And the thinking there is that three data sets matched on three type curves simultaneously is better than one. Uh, it gives us a little bit more character to the data. We can get a sen better sense of the pattern recognition. Again, type curve analysis is all about pattern recognition. If I can see all three of these together and match them together, um, hopefully I've, I've uh, got a good sense of what's going on. Um, something to look for here, when the derivative curve and the normalized rate curve, which is in red, converge and start to cross each other, that indicates that you have well-developed boundary-dominated flow. 
okay? And then the integral curve sits up here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what these curves mean. I'm gonna go, go back to the slides to do that. Okay, a rate integral, and this is an idea that Blassingame came up with uh, many years ago, is uh, a way to smooth noisy production data. And uh, uh, Blassingame, who's a professor at Texas A&M, he, uh, he came, comes from a pressure transient background, and what he was trying to do here was he was, he was experimenting with ways of doing uh, drawdown analysis. Um, in, in, and we all, uh, you know, in, a, in the pressure transient world, what we usually do is build up analysis because we get smoother data. But what Blassingame wanted to do is he said, well, I want to analyze the drawdown data and try and do a derivative analysis on that data. And of course, the data is noisy, so it's difficult to do. So we invented this rate integral. And the rate integral is a cumulative average of production data. Um, one way to think about uh, a rate integral, and I'll give you a bit of an analogy here, is it's, it's sort of like if you started at your house and you drove your car to work, uh, you're gonna be going an average speed if you looked at the whole trip. But at different points during the trip, of course, your speed's gonna change. You're gonna stop at stoplights, you're gonna increase your speed, you're gonna decrease your speed at different times. The actual speed, instantaneous speed that you're going at any point in time is sort of like your production rate. The rate integral would be if you wanted to calculate that in my car driving analogy, it would be if you looked at your trip meter at any point in your trip, trip and divided it by the total amount of time that you'd been on the road. So it's like a cumulative average speed. And then when you got to the end of your journey, you'd have the total amount of time that you've been on the road divided by the total, uh, I'm sorry, the total distance that you've traveled divided by the total amount of time that you've been on the road. So that analogy carries very nicely for production where of course things are changing all the time and uh, a rate integral where things are, are smooth, okay? And that's exactly the purpose for doing this sort of exercise. We want to smooth out the kinks in here. We don't wanna see these things jumping up and down. We wanna end up with a nice smooth uh, production plot. Now the important thing to know about this is it's not a replacement for production rates. In fact, these two curves will, will diverge, right? Because I'm always going back to the beginning and taking the average. So if I have a declining trend in my production data, my rate integral will also decline, but it will decline much more gradually because I'm always going back and averaging to the beginning. So uh, as a result, when we go back and look at, at blasting game, <clears throat> this is the rate integral curve in blue and the normalized rate curve shown in red. They are um, curves that are really attached together, but there are two different curves. So you get two different data sets plotted together on two different sets of type curves. And you can see that the blue uh, set of data or the rate integral data is much smoother than the red set of data or normalized rate data. That's the um, actual definition for it. And, and it includes the pressures as well. It's not just the production rates, but includes the delta P component as well. <clears throat> Okay, um, why, why is it that Blassingame developed this idea of the rate integral? Well, one of the things that you can do once you have this rate integral is you can produce a derivative curve that's based on the smooth data rather than a derivative curve that's based on the noisy production data. When we try to apply a derivative to a noisy data signal, we end up getting a, a shotgun blast effect a lot of the times. So the, what Blassingame has invented is this integral derivative curve which tries to maximize the strengths of, of both, both a smooth curve and a derivative. And let me talk a little bit about this. One of the drawbacks of integrating or smoothing the curve out is that it can smooth out small changes that would normally be the things you're looking for to see, you know, uh, flow regime changes and so on. Um, by doing both of these operations together, hopefully we can maximize the strengths of the integral and the derivative. So when we look at the whole picture together, we take three, these three uh, data plots and we look at them on the same plot together. And just to give you an idea, I'm gonna move over to this one for a sec, just to give you an idea of how uh, a data set uh, that where you take the derivative without smoothing it looks like. Um, that's partly the reason for doing what Blassingame did. Um, you can't really make much sense of this because 
even small changes in the production rates will produce a large scatter effect when you try and take the derivative. So the integral curve kind of controls that a little bit better. Okay, um, so that's our blasting game analysis. Uh, there are different starting models that we may want to consider. If we have a vertical well, we use this radial model and uh, the um, picture of the reservoir that goes with this picture is basically a circle with our well bore in the center and the radius of this is our well bore radius or apparent well bore radius and the radius of the reservoir is RE. <clears throat> and that's kind of our standard basic uh, production model. When we start to get into tight gas though, or tight oil, uh, we, may, we may need to use fracture uh, type curves. And fracture type curves are similar to, to this sort of picture, um, except in the case of fracture type curves, we have a fracture in the middle of the reservoir rather than a vertical well. And the advantage of using something like this is I can make that fracture uh, quite large if I want to. And instead of using RE and RWA, I use uh, XF for the fracture and the RE. The RE is the same, but the XF is now used instead of the, uh, of the RWA. And we can take it further. We can start to look at finite conductivity fracture models, elliptical flow models. With the elliptical flow models, uh, we're actually analyzing reservoir drainage patterns that are not circular but are, 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 are oblong. And uh, as, as we get into, this is particularly going to be important if we have horizontal wells or very tight gas wells that are fractured. Uh, in many cases, these sorts of systems are anisotropic, which means that we have inflow coming in preferentially from one direction. And you'll start to get drainage areas that are not circular anymore. In fact, they're, they're elliptical. And so these type curves will handle those sorts of situations. How do we know what sort of situation we have? When we look at a production data set, how do we know whether it's got elliptical flow or you know, circular flow or, 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 or what, what have you? Well, we don't always know ahead of time. Okay? Sometimes we can tell by the shape of the data. So a lot of times, if we know that we've got a fractured well or horizontal well, we might want to try matching it on these curves to see if it fits. Um, if it fits on the simple radial flow model, then it's often a good idea to go with the simplest model that's available. So these sets of type curves are all there, and you can test your data against them to see whether they fit properly. Um, and, and sometimes there'll be non-unique solutions, but hopefully we, we can find one that fits the data and also fits with the, you know, the other things that we know about the reservoir. There's also horizontal well models. There's uh, water drive models. Um, all of these different things are available. So Blasting Game has provided um, a full package of type curves to analyze many different production situations that we might come across and try and come up with some parameters and learn something about the reservoir. <clears throat>